Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I'm the Communication Specialist for UA Museums. And joining me today is Catherine Edge, Director of the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum. And I also see that we have two guests with us. Catherine, would you like to introduce them this morning? Yes, I would love to. Um, we have with us uh, Dr. John Friel, who is the director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History, and Haley Bryant, who is the Youth Services Manager with the Tuscaloosa Public Library. So thank you both so much for joining us this morning. Oh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks for being with us. And just as a reminder, if anybody is watching with us live, you can ask Haley and John questions. If you'd like, just uh, drop a comment in the comment section. And remember, this is live, so anything can happen. Uh, hopefully there will be no problems, but you never know with uh, live production. So uh, now that we've gotten some of that business out of the way, how should we get started talking? Because we're going to be talking about uh, Bama Bug Fest on the web that uh, just happened uh, the last three weeks. So how should we get started in that conversation? Well, um, I figured it would be a good idea just to get um, get everybody's brief background, including you, Rebecca, because you were very involved with uh, Bama Bug Fest on the web uh, this year. And uh, so, uh, John, can you just tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what and where did you study? Sure. So I've, I've been the director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History for a little over five years now. Uh, prior to coming to UA, I was at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, uh, where I was a senior research associate as well as curator of the university's fish, amphibian, and reptile collections, uh, doing research. I uh, didn't have exhibits at that museum, but I was doing research kind of behind the scenes stuff, all the things we're doing with our, kind of what our current research and collections department does. And I decided to kind of get interested more in, in kind of the public facing aspects of museums and uh, applied for the job here and got it. So uh, I really kind of moved from the back of the house to the front of the house, but I'm professionally trained as a biologist. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of Central Florida. I went on to get my PhD in zoology at Duke University, did a brief postdoc at Florida State University prior to, to uh, going to Cornell, working there for a little over 16 years. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Haley, what's, uh, tell us a bit about your background and um, what and where did you study and how did you become, how did you end up in libraries? Um, so I actually thought that I was going to be a great American author um, going through school. So I got my undergraduate at UA in English. And so my, after I graduated, I got a job here in the youth services department. I love working with kids. I actually taught a couple of the people, at, their kids that work here at swim lessons. So I knew some people before I came in and I was excited to see them again. So I was like, okay, this is something I could do for the rest of my life. So I went back to UA and got my master's degree in library and information studies. And uh, it, um, I moved for a year last year and then I came back um, at the end of 2019 and I got the youth services manager position and been going strong with you guys and the library since. Um, I love, like I said, I love working with kids. You can you look at my desk right now. I mean, this is my life. So, <laughs> um, so it's awesome. It's awesome to be able to do fun things like this too. Fantastic. And uh, Rebecca, we uh, we talked we talked with you last week, but um, you want to just remind everybody how, how you came to, to UA Museums? Yeah, I actually uh, went to school at the University of Alabama. I graduated with a, a degree in telecommunications and film and specifically broadcast television production. So I went to school to learn how to run a camera, how to direct, how to uh, switch and uh, edit video. Um, and so from there, after college, I worked in local news for about two years. I was a video editor. I did some production there. Um, and then I got a job at Turner in Atlanta, which is now the Warner Media Group. They've gone through several name changes uh, since I started working there. Uh, but I lived and worked in Atlanta for about 14 years. I've worked for TBS, TNT, TCM, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, True TV, um, all of the Turner networks. Um, and so I did uh, video editing and uh, digital media encoding uh, uh, for, for them for most of that time. And then I, uh, wanted a, a change. I wanted to come back to Alabama cause that's where my family is. And, um, I found this job at UA museum. So that's uh, kind of how I transitioned back to Alabama. Well, we, we certainly, certainly love having you um, in the department and with everything going on, there's absolutely no way that we, well, I mean, we probably could have done it, but we would have done it as well. I don't, I don't think any of us can, can deny that. Um, 
But um, today, we're, I thank you all for uh, for those, um, you know, for that information and um, a little bit about your background. But um, one of the reasons that we're all coming together to talk today is because we've all recently been involved with Bama Bug Fest on the web. Uh, so, John, can you give us just a, a, a brief history of what what Bama Bug Fest is? Sure. Um, shortly after I got here, uh, the University of Alabama, um, I wanted to create a new program. We have very, some very successful programs like our museum expedition and others, but they really weren't my baby. So I kind of really wanted to come up with uh, something that you know was unique, um, wasn't duplicating any efforts here. And uh, it's about that time that John Abbott arrived here, our entomologist that's on staff, and talking to him, and uh, he hadn't been involved in very large successful festivals in Austin, Texas, where they, he had lived previously. And looking into it, I realized these are incredibly popular device, um, events. Some of them attract tens of thousands of people. And uh, I was developing at the time an interest in uh, local insects and arthropods. So I said, this is perfect. Uh, let's start something. And in, initially in 2016, it was just focused on moths. Uh, we had an event that was part of National Moth Week. Uh, we held it at Mountville Archaeological Park. And we had about 75 people showed up in 2016. Uh, the next year, the numbers doubled. The third year, we decided to um, let's try doing it in Tuscaloosa to see what Mount Mountville is beautiful and not that far outside of Tuscaloosa. We still thought it might be a barrier for some people coming out because uh, so we had the opportunity to do it at the Transportation Museum. And lo and behold, we had over 300 people show up. So that was a big success. And we decided to kind of, you know, we've got something here. Let's, what can we have expanded even more? And we decided, well, let's not limit it to moths. What if we expand it to all arthropods or bugs as we call them? Um, so that's what we did. So we held our first Bama Bug Fest at the Transportation Museum last year. And we had, what is it, over 1,300 people showed up. We were blown away, but we, we couldn't believe the numbers. And we realized um, it could continue to grow. We, it has the potential to grow at that kind of rate. And we were all set to do it. Uh, in 2020, uh, we were actually going to probably expand over into the Tuscaloosa Public Library's property, maybe even close down Queen City Avenue to improve, uh, improve uh, traffic flow. And then lo and behold, um, COVID-19 happened and we decided uh, we need to do something different. And the only real option for us was to do something virtual. So that, that kind of forced our hand uh, to move on the web this year. And uh, it's been an interesting experiment. So, um having having Bama Bug Fest move this, you know, under these circumstances from a, a physical event that mm -hmm. would have taken place this past Saturday here at the Transportation mm -hmm. Museum to a virtual platform. Um, Rebecca, can you talk about some of the challenges that existed in converting an event um, from a physical experience into a, a virtual one? Yeah, I think a lot of it was just trying to figure out what we could do uh, on the web that we wanted to do physically and try to translate that to an online experience. And then also trying to figure out how long we wanted it to be. Did we want it to be three weeks? Did we want it to be one day? Uh, did we want, you know, what were the time frames that we wanted to put all the content on? Um, so it was, a lot of it was just uh, figuring out what we wanted to do for Bama Bug Fest in terms of the programming and uh, the things that we wanted to communicate and the people we wanted to have on. So a lot of those discussions were about uh, maybe, you know, let's try thematic days and uh, let's do it these at these times during the day. And so a lot of that was the, the scheduling and um, the content sort of came out of that. We had a lot of really great brainstorming sessions and, uh, you know, it was a real team effort to, to get all of that programming and, and content together. And the library certainly had had a, a huge, you know, part to do with that. Not only are they um, immediate adjacent neighbors to the Transportation Museum where the event typically takes place, it um, it absolutely made sense to to continue to work and collaborate with the the library, moving it to a virtual platform. Um, Haley, do you have any, um, you know, were there any specific challenges from the library perspective that? Um, that you and uh, Sadie had to to talk through and and work through in this conversion that we we were all forced more or less forced into. I think probably the biggest challenge for us was that we were in the process of opening our doors as well. So communication was just everywhere, trying to make sure we could get our stuff online as well as get information to Rebecca so that it could be online via our page as well. So really getting everyone on the same page on our end so that we could do that since we were all focused, okay, our doors open this day, you know, and all of our other programming this day um, 
but it worked out so beautifully. What a great team working with you all and being able to collaborate. So it worked out and went really well. Well, we really, we really appreciate everything that, that the library does, not, not only for the community, but also in, you know, collaboration with, with us in this particular, particular project. Um, John, what do you think were some of the benefits of having the event online instead of instead of in person? Sure. Um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. If you would have asked me this before the event, I, I would have thought it would all have been all been challenges that we had to overcome. We had some really popular events um, that were, you know, involved audience participation, um, the cricket spitting contest, the cockroach tractor pulls. Those were really big events last year, and, and we couldn't do them. So I, I had this fear that we wouldn't be able to come up with content. Um, but in hindsight, I realized we were incredibly creative. Like I said, uh, this was a, a team effort. I think all of us brought something to the table. We had a lot of crazy ideas. Not all of them actually made it to production, but many of them did. And uh, a good number of them were actually incredibly successful and probably turned out better than I think we would have imagined um, uh, prior to the event. So um, what I, the one thing I did realize is we had the opportunity, um, while people couldn't come to us physically in Tuscaloosa to be part of the event, being online, we could reach out to uh, partners that were way beyond uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and beyond. So we did that this year. We had uh, participants from all over the U.S. Um, that if we had actually tried to do it physically at the Transportation Museum and the Public Library, we couldn't have done. These people couldn't have been here. So I realized that was an incredible degree of freedom that uh, wasn't on my radar till we actually had to do some virtual programming. And I think uh, it really allowed us to do things that uh, we wouldn't have been able to do. I don't think we, I don't know if we could have gotten a local cosplayer to do Black Widow or Spider-Man or a local spider expert that we could uh, tap into their knowledge. So um, moving it to a virtual platform gave us that. It also gave us the ability to do both live uh, streaming where we could engage the public in almost real time with questions and comments, as well as some pre-recorded um, higher production pieces as well. And I think if you look at our schedule of, of, of the uh, things we produced, it's a nice mixture of those. And uh, they, they complement each other. Some things, you know, sometimes it's great to have the live component of it because it really is, you, you have a sense of uh, urgency and, and you can interact more. The prepared stuff you kind of have to watch and then wait for people to send comments. But I like the mixture of it. I think that was something that uh, was a success for us. And Rebecca, were there any, um, you know, major tech challenges that, um, that developed um, as as the content developed. Um, what were some of the tech challenges, and how did how did you uh, how did you overcome those? I mean, with any live uh, stuff, I mean, uh, we we all know with the museums, we've been doing it uh, since the pandemic uh, started. So there are uh, live challenges that come with that, with inter internet connectivity issues, and uh, sometimes people's devices don't seem to work. Uh, we we did have a few of those during some of our live streams um, where. Uh, somebody's internet went out or uh, Dr. Echeverry at one point, his, his power had gone out right before. Um, so there, there were, there were uh, challenges that we, you know, we couldn't control that we did have to overcome. And a lot of that is just trying to work around, find, find the workaround to that problem. And sometimes, unfortunately, it might mean you have to take that person out. If they're, if their internet's not working, they can't hear us. They can't talk to us. Sometimes you just have to take those people out until they can get reconnected and, and the, problems fixed. And uh, a lot of that is just, um, you have to keep the conversation going. You have to just uh, kind of deal with the problem and then just kind of keep the ball rolling, keep the keep the ball in the air, if, if you will. Um, so uh, so some of that happens with live broadcasts and, and you just kind of have to work around it. And what I found with live streaming is that the people watching are usually pretty patient because I think a lot of people watching know that that kind of thing can happen. And um, so it's, it's nice when people are, are patient with you enough to kind of stick through it, uh, especially if the content is good and, and they're interested in the topic. So a lot of the, the live streaming problems uh, were just due to internet connectivity and, and some of that. Uh, there, there was an, uh, an interesting instance, uh, a little bit behind the scenes, with the cosplayers um, like Spider-Man, of course, his his eyes, uh, it, you, you wouldn't know unless you'd seen him before, but he um, his eyes have to be put in separately uh, from his costume. So they're they're sort of the last piece that goes in. And when that happens, he can't really see anything. Um, and so so uh, he wasn't able to see us very well, but he could hear us and interact with us. So there were there were things like that with just, you know, very specific things that would happen with each different live stream that brought its own challenges. 
And and were there any tech challenges in spe- in particular that come to mind that uh, that occurred to any during any of the recorded um, recorded segments? So I'm thinking, um, you know, having the uh, the the afternoon with the apiarist where um, you know there was uh, you know the opportunity to show um, you know anybody watching what it's like to actually have a beehive because that's you know growing in popularity has been growing in popularity for the past past few years. So what were there any challenges with with that particular segment that um, that you had to maybe get a little creative or think on the fly? Yeah, we initially talked about it as if. Um uh whoever was going to shoot the video would put the bee suit on and interact with the bees get really close to the bees um i personally did not want to do that because i did not think i would be a a good fit for that um just because i'm inexperienced and 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 don't know how to interact with the bees um so we then came up with the idea of strapping a gopro to the the apiarist and I, i thought that turned out really well we did have some challenges you know with those those clips on the GoPro, sometimes they don't, you know, they don't work the way you want them to. And so you kind of have to fight it a little bit, but we, we ended up getting uh, that connected to him. And I think it turned out really well to give his perspective um, in what he was doing to make you feel like you were part of uh, his process and, and be in his place. So we did have some GoPro issues, but the, the video turned out really well. And I think it, it brought a, a new perspective and uh, none of us had to put the bee suit on, which was good. Um, so, uh, so we did have some of those uh, challenges and a, a lot of time with uh, some of the things that we did pre-recorded, um, you know, a lot of that was trying to make sure you had the video edited uh, in a good time to get it posted. So a lot of that was just, you know, can, can we get this uh, together in time to get it posted? And we, we met all of our needs and um, uh, everybody worked really hard to get that completed. And Haley, were there any, uh, there were a couple of um, segments that, uh, that were specific to the, the public library, either a craft or uh, reading a story, you know, something along those lines, which were, which were wonderful. Did, um, did y'all have any, any tech challenges that, uh, that had to be, had to be overcome or rethought um, <laughs> very quickly? <laughs> Well, so I just, I did one of the crafts and I am not as tech savvy as everyone. So I think my biggest challenge is I would record something and then I would watch it. I'm like, oh my gosh, is that what I sound like? Like I I realize I'm my biggest critic when it comes to recording. Um, But I was able to communicate like Sadie, she recorded a story time, did such a great job. Um, And I was able to communicate with some people and say, okay, what do I need to do about this? How can I add this? How can I explain this better um so a lot of it was me saying oh goodness this is this is a uh, uh not great <laughs> so but um like i said there are a lot of really great tech savvy people sadly i'm not one of them at this time but this summer has really really helped this pandemic as well has really helped me uh, work on my tech skills so <laughs> for better or for worse i guess is the best way to do it. I, I think a lot of yes, people I are like that, that Haley. So, so don't don't feel like you're the only one who uh, doesn't uh, maybe you know uh, enjoy being on camera. A lot of people are like that, including me. Yes, I, I think we're all going to have a, a brand new skill set by the time this is all over. <laughs> yeah. Strictly, um, strictly in terms of the um, you know, the amount of uh, tech usage that we're all suddenly um, being more or less thrown into and um so i i think i i think that's a very fair assessment and um i i have to admit that um i very rarely go back and and review the things that, you know even these live streams that i've done you know um that or been a part of i very rarely go back and i'd one of the things that it's kind of taught me is I'm like, okay, I can now understand why some movie stars and you know people on television and all that do all of this for a living, they never ever watch their performances. I yeah. get it, you know. It's like I totally <laughs> understand now, um, and because I, if if I were in that realm. I now realize I would be one of those people, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, if I could do that over again, I would do it so differently. And yes. so, um, so I, I completely, the way that your face kind of moves and you're like, wow, do I do that when I, <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
Ex exactly. Ex <laughs> even like minute little things like that. I'd be like, I didn't blink at the right moment during that scene. Can we redo it? And I I would be one of those people. Um, but um, so, you know, we we all experienced uh, some level of, of challenge with the event, but there were there was also there were so many fun, uh, fun discussions and all of the planning and, you know, overall it was it was designed to be a, a fun um, fun event so um john what was one of your um what was one of your favorite aspects or segments of bama bug fest on the web uh, i really enjoyed the cosplay ones um again this was something that um, really was a team effort i like the idea when we were able to combine um, rebecca had connections through her interests in uh, uh, comics to uh, cosplayers uh, I reached out to scientists and we had Allie reached out to the local comic book stores. And it was just, you know, I didn't know a lot of, I knew more about the science, but not as much about um, the comic book characters and their backstories. So I really liked that intersection of it. You know, I, I, for me as a scientist, um, well, I love the science. I realized it's not everyone's cup of tea and to make things engaging. Um, I like to have something for everybody. And I know so, so things like popular culture uh, generally most people have some interest in so those segments to me really they had all the things i really liked about bama bug fest there was something for everyone there was some real science uh, real scientists talking about um, really interesting things in biology uh, we had there was humor involved there was um, you know comic books uh, movies television it was that world, it was that intersection, which I found really interesting. And everyone, all the experts we had were experts in their own field, but I think everyone through that exchange will learn something. Um, even if the comic book character, you know, the comic book bookstore doesn't like spiders, he loves spider bad and can appreciate and vice versa. And, you know, we lucked out because we occasionally we had people like our spider expert who not only was a spider expert, but he loved Spider-Man, was really into it. And I liked the way um, he connected with Miles Morales. Um, you know, that was something I really, that was my favorite bit when he had, uh, you know, was talking about how his connection to that character, having grown up in New York City and um, being a mixed race and, uh, you know, that character, I think part of his appeal it was great to see a scientist who was actually inspired by that and just connected with that. So I, I love that aspect of it. So that was probably my favorite segment of everything. Yeah, I really enjoyed those as well because it was a, a it was a way to um, uh, blend some of those things together. And I enjoyed actually. Um, I would be the one who was switching the uh, camera shots uh, back and forth. And that at some point, I just uh, had the camera on. You know, Dr. Echeverry with Spider Man, and they just interacted with each other. Uh, you know. The host didn't have to do anything. It just to let them talk to each other was the, the fun part. And uh, uh, when we did our Helgermite um, uh, live stream with uh, Justice League, who played Helgermite on Supergirl, uh, it was fun to have him interact with uh, Dr. Abbott um, because Helgermite in the comics is actually an entomologist. So uh, that was really fun for me to introduce that character to Dr. Abbott, who is an entomologist. So I, I thought that that was really special. So I, I think those those worked out really, really well because it was fun to see, you know, those different parts of, you know, the comic book world and the science world kind of interact with each other and enjoy talking to each other. Like Justice would ask Dr. Abbott questions. And so uh, I think they were all really interested to learn about the other side of the thing that they had been interested in. Well, and I think fortunately for all of us, um, you know, super superheroes are superheroes are 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 in right now you know so um you know uh, if we had tried to do this you know a number of years ago whenever spider-man was like just you know creeping back into popular culture you know it may not have it, it may not have had the same result but you know fortunately for us spider-man's really big and you know supergirl is really being you know these these superheroes that draw their inspiration from the natural world are are in right now and that is uh that's certainly a benefit to us with uh something with uh, something like bama bug fest but particularly on the web again having the opportunity to reach out to and communicate communicate and, and work with these people that, you know, otherwise we may not be able to, um, you know, to, to get to Tuscaloosa physically. So, um, Haley, what was one of your um, favorite aspects or segments of, um, of Buckfest this year? 
Rebecca kind of touched on this earlier, but I loved all the beekeeping segments. Um, <laughs> kind of like you said, I kind of felt like I was involved and was able to experience on a different level. Um, also, I think it was on a personal kind of feeling for me because my, my dad actually, he had bees, but I was so young and he never let me get close. So I just saw from afar. And so being able to see some of the segments and schoolyard roots and them kind of talking more about that and I got to learn more. And, and think back, oh, okay, I remember us talking about this. Oh, I remember that. Um, but then seeing inside was really cool. And just getting to know and understand that process a little bit better was awesome. Very, very cool segment. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I didn't, um, I didn't know that you really, that you had a, uh, you know, childhood memory connection to, yeah. to that. That, that's all, oh, that's awesome. Um, so, um, get yeah, what, I guess, you know, having all this information that that is archived and available for everybody to go see, even though Bamba Bug Fest on the web ended this past Saturday on the 25th, all of the content is still available um, for, you know, anybody to go watch anytime that they they like. And so, you know, we encourage everybody that if you miss any segments or want to go back and review any segments, all of that information is still readily available. But um, John, I know you've got a background. Uh, you you know, in, in biology, but, um, what is your, but you're not, you're not an entomologist. Um, but what is your favorite bug? Who this is like picking your favorite child. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, Harper, I mean, I, I don't think I have a particular species. I mean, I would say particular groups. Um, and as you know, um, given the history of bug fest, moths were one of them. I really got into moths. And more recently, I've really been drawn to spiders. So I, you know, if, you had, if I had to pick between those two, I'm probably going to lean towards spiders right now. Um, but uh, like I said, I, it, there, there's, it's like a candy shop. There's so much diversity. And again, you know, I, I, if you ask me next year, I may have a different group. But right now, I would probably say it's spiders. Haley, do you have a, um, do you have a favorite bug that you, you, you now have a fresh affinity for that you uh, didn't have before, uh, before Bama Bug Fest? So I guess when we talked last time, I was, I talked about how I love butterflies and moths, but I think this whole, this last month doing Bug Fest has kind of opened my eyes to explore more bugs that are outside. And so actually uh, maybe two weeks ago at the library, we found an Eastern Hercules beetle, which threw me back to a bug slide. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought it was the coolest thing. Um, so right now, I I don't know. That's actually my screen saver. So um, I thought that was the coolest looking bug I've ever seen. Uh, Rebecca, do you do you have a do you have a favorite bug or a new favorite bug um, from all the all the experience with Bugfest? Yeah, I, I'm not really a spider person, but, uh, and, and Dr. Friel uh, kind of told me this several months ago that jumping spiders would be the way into spiders. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he's right because jumping spiders are kind of cute. They, uh, they're, they're a little furry and they have, you know, all the eyes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so jumping spiders, I think I would like to learn more about. Um, but I also really have enjoyed getting to learn more about bees um, especially, uh, uh, there was a lot of bee butt talk in uh, one of our wrap ups about how you can distinguish, you can distinguish different kinds of bees by their backsides, whether they're furry or they're shiny. Um, so, so that was a lot of fun to learn more about bees, um, just because I had never really realized that bees have a little bit of, you know, fur on them. Um, so that was, that was kind of interesting to learn. So, uh, I, those are, I think the two, the two bugs, uh, that I would like to learn more about. And so what, um, you know, now that um, we've, we've all survived in um, some capacity, Bama Bug Fest on the web 2020. So what, um, are there any future plans for the event that can be shared at this time? John, are there any future plans that, that can be shared uh, now? Like I said, uh, I don't think we've got anything we can really, I mean, we're hoping to be back in person next year. Uh, and even if we do, I think we're all in agreement that we'll probably will have some online content as well because this has been so successful and uh i think we need to continue the tradition i think it may be a little bit of a hybrid event i think we'll you know always want to have a large physical event uh, but i think for promotion purposes uh for segments that we just can't do in person um i think we're still going to do some of this i think it was it was such an um exciting event um there, we had some real successes i think we uh, there's things we probably replicate. I, there's 
obviously topics and ideas we didn't pursue this year that, um, you know, as you pointed out, um, you know, it, it, it's great when you can tap into kind of current events and, and, and things that are of interest to people. So it's hard to know a year out, like what, what movies are going to pe people be excited about? Well, will people still be into superheroes? Maybe there'll be something else that, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about animal crossing because that game, um, I don't play it myself, but I, just on social media, I see people that do play it, posting about it and talking about collecting bugs mm -hmm. and trading bugs. And there's a, that's a whole world that really didn't exist last year. Hopefully it will still be growing uh, and be popular next year. Before that there was Pokemon, but I think doing something with games and insects and bugs will be something I want to pursue next year. And uh, Rebecca, do you have any thoughts on, um, you know, any future plans as uh, uh you know, as it, as we move forward. Yeah. I think like Dr. Friel, I think it's um, maybe something we should look at in terms of what was successful. What, what, what did people seem really interested in um, on the, on the virtual version? Um, I know that stand-up comedy was probably our most watched live stream. Um, it, was, it was, it was actually very funny. I didn't know how they were going to uh, pull that yeah. off, but they did it and they did it so wonderfully. And uh, all the comics were great and they seem to have a good time. It, yeah. it was probably nice for them because, you know, they can't go into a, you know, a stand up club mm -hmm. and uh, do their, their, their stand up sets uh, right now. So they g gave them an audience. Yeah. It gave them uh, a way to practice their, their stand up and, and do that. Yeah. So I, I, you know, one, one of my questions is like, can we translate that into a physical in person mm -hmm. uh, situation? Yeah. So uh, I think just kind of reassessing what did people like? What did people seem really interested in and seeing how we can translate that into future events. Well, hopefully uh, it, it would, I, I agree. I think it would be really, really great to have, um, you know, have some kind of performance aspect. And fortunately, um, you know, here at the Transportation Museum, we have built-in bleachers that are part of the property. So there's <laughs> yeah. automatically a nice um, quasi-comfortable place that's not the ground mm -hmm. for, um, you know, for people to sit. So that that's definitely something yeah. um, that I, I think we should all, continue to think about because i think that would be great um yeah my idea would be to have them in costume as insects i think a la john <laughs> belushi and the killer bee i think that would be a great homage uh have them up there because it just would have been that much funnier if they had a little antenna while they were telling their jokes and <laughs> Well, they they had what I thought was really smart is they adapted their stand up to what we had been doing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our yep. presentations were PowerPoint yeah. driven, and so mm -hmm. they they came with their own PowerPoint uh, presentations and and mixed the comedy within that that form. So uh, so they could probably uh, figure out a different way to present it in person. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, again, I, I think the, the opportunities are just, um, endless practically with the, with what, what we can do, not just because as, as John's already mentioned, you know, the, there's so much diversity within bugs that makes it, um, really a lot easier on us to be diversified in the content we provide and, uh, discuss and, you know, how all of that comes together. So, um, Haley, do you have any, um, have you, your creativity been sparked for uh, future future Bama bug best things? I think this time it kind of showed me personally that we all need to stay kind of connected. So this, I think we did a great job with connecting, like you were talking about earlier, um, different people from all over, getting people who watch from all over. And I think even next year, hopefully there will be, like you said, have some more virtual content, even if, Hopefully we can do something live because I haven't been able to come to a live um, event yet. But um, I think it'd be so fun to have even people from all over the world talk about different bugs that they see in their backyard. I think that was something that we discussed during the planning. Um, so I, I definitely loved the virtual content. I obviously want to have the live um, event, but some sort of virtual something has really helped connect everyone during this time where we've been staying at home and uh, just be able to see other things around the world and even get to know different people from Alabama, University of Alabama, hopefully the library. So ways to stay connected, but also bring something to people they can get outside and come to the transportation museum. So I think it was, I think it was a great event. I'd like to do a little bit of both over here. <laughs> I, I I agree. I think um, I think after uh, you know after this um, situation, there um, 
the the possibilities of um, that we had maybe thought about as far as having virtual content uh, may have been a couple of years in in the future, but now is you know definitely I think something that we can um, more readily incorporate and and will hopefully incorporate um, as we do any of our um, you know planning as we all move forward. Um, so about Bama Bug Fest specifically, John, any final thoughts about about Bug Fest on the web uh, before we kind of talk about some some other projects? That sure. You I would encourage anyone that's watching this or watching the event to send us feedback. Again, we want to be responsive. Um, again, uh, you know, th this is, we want this to be a two way conversation. So uh, I think we have some great ideas. There's there, I know there's ideas that are none of our minds that viewers will suggest. And I really want to encourage people um, to suggest something because we really are open um, and we want this to be a diverse uh, program. We really want it to be a community festival. We have, you know, uh, festivals in our area like the Kentuck Festival that are incredibly popular. I want it, you know, this to grow every year. And the idea is um, there they'll, they'll, will be activities that will probably be, we'll do the same every year, like some of our contests, the tractor pulls and the cricket spinning contest. But we want to keep adding new content and new ideas, uh, engaging new groups, maybe new partnerships. Um, I think that's where the excitement is. Um, you know, this is, We've only been at this for two years as the bug fest, but I am just blown away about how successful it's been. And I know, um, give us 10 years, I can't imagine how successful this would be and the kind of numbers, um, you know, I think our vision one day is to have something like on the main campus, much like a game day where the entire quad is occupied with tents and activities that are all bug themed because um, it, it has that potential. And at other universities um, that have similar programs, it, it can reach that potential. And uh, Rebecca, any any final thoughts on on Bugfest on the web? Yeah, I was really impressed by everyone in the the planning committee for coming up with really creative ideas. Everybody um, wanted to participate and wanted to um, come up with things that were uh, interesting and different and uh, were a lot of fun. And so I was really impressed with how everybody. Um, came up with these awesome ideas and we were able to do most of them. And so I, I think it turned out really well. And uh, like I said, it was a, a tremendous group effort. And um, I, I think we managed to uh, accomplish what we set out to do. So I, and hopefully um, even if it was virtual, hopefully people will uh, maybe go back and watch our, our videos from this year when next year comes around, when, when the next family bug fest comes around and hopefully what we created will, um, we'll put that in people's minds and, and encourage them to come into a live event, uh, seeing what we did in the past in, in, in the virtual sense. So hopefully um, the virtual event will help encourage people to come out uh, whenever we are able to do it in person in the future. Yes. I, I have a feeling from all the content that was created in, in order to, to do it on, on a virtual platform. The next time we were able to have a physical event, I'm smelling a few commercials because we have so much that is, is readily available that can, you know, can be cut and spliced together. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm smelling, I'm smelling a few commercials oh, in, oh, our, yeah. in our can, future. We can definitely create something like that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and uh, Haley, what, um, what, uh, what are what are your kind of final final thoughts before we talk about some other projects that uh, y'all have going on at the library? I was really impressed with everybody who wanted to participate in a sense, like the community reaching out with comments, and, and we had a lot of people calling us about the uh, the art submission. So um, I was just really glad that people were very interested in the virtual event, very interested in all the wonderful programs that or being held throughout the weeks and wanting to be involved with it. So just kind of remind me how thankful I am for the community and how they wanted to be involved and still still roll with the, what we were trying to do and uh, adapt with us and kind of still support no matter what happened. So. I, I completely agree. We actually have a comment real quick uh, from uh, Ron. Ron says this year you had Spider-Man. Maybe next year you can feature the tick. So <laughs> I think that's something that will, um, that's something that we can certainly consider. I don't know. Maybe we can have, uh, maybe we can have a Bama book Fest dog day and it'll all be <laughs> featured on Place and Ticks. <laughs> you know, Not who, who knows? Who knows? But you know, thank, thank you for the comment, Ron. We appreciate that. Um, so um, we've got a we've got a little bit of time left. So now that you know we've 
we've covered, you know, we've, we've talked about Bama Bugfest. Um, John, can you tell us about some future projects that the Natural History Museum is, is going to be, be focused on um, as we get closer to the start of semester and, mm -hmm. and hopefully some semblance of normalcy? Um, are there any projects that, um, that you can share with us for the Alabama Museum? Of yeah, Canada? I mean, I'm not, I can't really get into specifics because I think uh, a lot of things are very fluid right now. Um, we are, you know, as you said, we're getting ready to reopen the museum on campus. Um, students will be returning to campus in a few weeks. Um, it's just, you know, how that's going to work out. So part of me is I'm a little cautious. Um, we had actually several things that were planned for the spring that didn't happen. I actually had a new um, exhibit that was going to be tied in the trees of Alabama that has been postponed. Um, it was originally going to be in the spring and that was going to be right when the fall opened. Um, that still might be a possibility this year. I just don't know. And I don't want to basically say it's going to happen because it could easily be bumped again. So that's our big thing. Um, you know, normally our big event in the fall, we have um, national fossil day as well as um, a haunting at the museum. And again, we are already starting discussions, uh, having a plan B in case um, we can't have the, the physical event that we had last year. So hopefully uh, we'll take some of the successes uh, we learned through the Bama Bug Fest and apply those to those uh, events as well. So I wish I could give you more details, but uh, quite honestly, um, the, a lot of things are still very much in motion and uh, we are may have to shift very quickly from doing um, our normal physical event to doing another virtual event for these uh, kind of annual fall events we typically do. Oh, Rebecca, you're just going to, you're going to be on constant speed dial if, <laughs> if any of us have to do any kind of shift. It'll be, okay, what do we need? Call Rebecca. And um, so, well, yeah, cause I, I completely understand we're in, we're in this same sense of flux down here at the Transportation mm -hmm. Museum too. And um, so it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting time to try to be planning because you really can't plan too far in the future you know, because we don't really know what that, you know, too far in the future may entail. Mm. So, yeah. So. But um, what, uh, what are, what are some, some potential future projects that you've thought of, Rebecca, that, that may, you know, um, you know, may be able to, to happen? Yeah, I think what Bama Bugfest ha or, or on the web, the Bama Bugfest on the web uh, virtual event has taught us is that we can go outside of what we normally do and try new things. And uh, since this, I, I'm just now coming up to a full year with UA Museum. So I had just been getting used to all of the events and uh, all of the things that UA Museums has been doing. And so now I'm having to sort of look at it a different way to see if there, maybe there's something, if we had to do it a different way, how would we do it? Um, and what I think the online virtual components that we've been doing has taught us is that we can try different things and new things. And so we've we've been pitching ideas about how we can engage the uh, student, the UA student community a little differently or the, you know, the Tus Tuscaloosa public community. Um, so we're, we're just going to we're going to try a few new things, I think, this year. And um, hopefully we'll be able to still create um, uh, good video uh, content that people will enjoy and and maybe just, you know, try some new things. Well, we, we found ourselves in the exact same um, situation and you thinking, okay, this is what we normally do. How can we, how can we adjust and move forward? Um, Cause we would normally have a physical exhibit that is bug related um, here at the transportation museum. And we had worked with a, a, a class um, at the university and the students took a number of very, very detailed photographs of insect specimens from research and collections. And they had stacked them together in order to showcase all of this very, very fine and minute detail. And the idea was to have them on display, feature the students' work and really highlight that, but then also immediately correlate it to, um, to Bama Bugfest. And then everything shut down. And then we thought, okay, well, we still want to do this, unfortunately, because they were photographs and not, um, you know, not physical, um, you know, physical specimens or or artifacts, we then did, um, did my uh, staff and I did some research on our end and we developed an online exhibition, which we had never done before because um, we'd never needed to before. And so this, so that gave us an opportunity to, um, you know, go beyond our comfort zone yeah. and go, okay, how can we continue to um, provide this content? And um, 
And so Details Unseen, The Hidden Secrets of Bugs was uh, was was born and is uh, is is up and available as as long as we we choose to have it. So um, it you know, definitely comfort zones, I think, no longer exist uh, when um, in the constant you know development of of all of this. So. Um, you know, Haley, what are some of the uh, um, projects, if, if any, that you can um, you can speak to uh, that the library is uh, is working on? I think kind of John touched on it earlier. Everything is so fluid right now and constantly changing. But we do a lot with the schools. So currently we're trying to figure out how we can still bring tech to the schools whenever they do and will open and have students available. Um, so we're trying to adapt, maybe get some stuff online, which Bugfest has helped us a lot, figure out how we can create these videos as well as send out technology to the schools, but then have the videos online so they can go through the lessons and figure out how to maneuver and code things. Um, but that's still a question mark because a lot of the schools are still trying to figure out their plan. Um, also trying to figure out uh, how we can bring back programming for the lab for the library. Um, I think we're probably still going to go virtual with that for a while, but trying to change it up a little bit and offer something fun and different for parents and the kids. So everything is a big question mark, but <laughs> you talked about haunting at the museum and I just realized that time is still quickly moving. Mm -hmm. I did not realize how close we were to that, to that mm -hmm. point. So, yeah, um, we're most of it's still going to be online, but we're hoping to do something fun and different to change a little bit from what we offer during the summer. Maybe do something a little bit different for the fall. I know for sure that um, we're going to have Libby with uh, Metro Shelter. She's going to be doing some story time, so that'll be a fun thing that we're excited to offer. But other than that, we're not, you know, it's all up in the air. <laughs> well, is the... Un, um uh, correct. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is is the library currently open in in a limited capacity to be able to offer some opportunities to the community? Is that is that accurate? Yeah. So um, our main branch is currently open daily, except for Mondays and Sundays um, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we're allowing about 50 people, and it goes up a little bit every week as we as we can change it. Um, but 50-ish people can come in, you can browse. The computer lab is now open as well, um, and that's also limited capacity, but we're trying to offer as much as we can in a safe in a safe way, um, but people are able to even hold their stuff, put their stuff on hold if they are not interested in coming into the library or don't feel comfortable. So we're trying to get the materials out, um, but yeah, we love to see faces coming in and see some of the people we saw before everything shut down, but we, uh, but we do have the, we're able to do stuff like curbside and put materials on hold um, for the community. Well, I just want to put a, um, you know, put a, a, a plug in for us as well that anybody, um, anybody heading down to, um, to physically go into the library and spend a little bit of time in there, you have the opportunity just across the street to uh, come into the transportation museum. We are currently open for general visitation um so the the museum you know the museum is open and we're pretty much almost the exact same schedule tuesday through saturday 10 to 4 30 um so if uh, if you'd like if you're going a little store crazy and would like to get out of the house even if it's just for a little bit um you know rent a uh, borrow a book from the library and then come come see us for you know a little bit in the the transportation museum because we are we are open for general visitation as well with 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 limitations of course but um you know it, it is an option that that is available um so just to um i guess the the last the last question i guess i want to ask is um a little bit completely un, unrelated to everything else we've been talking about but um is related to social media but um john you've got some really your twitter feed is really colorful and filled with incredible fish. I know that is your your background. Um, so, can you just tell us a little bit about your interest? Like, how did how did you become interested? It's catfish, isn't it? Yeah, my but professionally, my the groups that I study are, are freshwater catfishes. So that's kind of my first how love. How do you become I'm, interested in catfish beyond just eating them? Um, well, they're just incredibly much like bugs. They're really diverse. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, yeah, you know, you mentioned catfish. The first thing I'm talking about is fried catfish comes to mind and catfish <laughs> farming. Um, and that's just one species that's commercially farmed, but there are 
just an incredible diversity of catfishes, many more than you probably realize. There are catfishes on all continents um, today, even fossils from Antarctica. Um, they're a dominant part of the freshwater fish fauna of the world. So almost every large river system in the world that has a really diverse group of catfishes. And that's true uh, in North America, true in South America, Asia, and Africa. So, uh, and they they do all kinds of crazy things. There are catfishes that feed on blood. Uh, there are gigantic catfishes. There are catfishes that do walk on land, can breathe air. So they're pretty diverse. And I think that's what attracted to me, me to them. And uh, the fact that I'm also kind of attracted to kind of weird fishes. And that's the other thing that uh, attracted me to them. So that's why I, myself study catfishes. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, um, there are other people that study much more beautiful fishes. Um, and I like to share their media. They have a couple of colleagues. Um, one of them is a student in Australia who's working on reef fishes. And he is just an amazing photographer. He actually used to do professional aquarium photography and then decided to go pursue a PhD. And he works on um, saltwater wrasses and their relatives, which are just stunning fish. Uh, and uh, I have another colleague that works at the California Academy of Sciences that also works on that. And both of them are just great underwater photographers and they just have these, you know, stunningly colored fish. Uh, so I share a lot of their media. You've probably seen some of their photos. Uh, they, they post almost every day. Um, and it's just a great way to connect. I think during the being homework from the pen, it was a, a way to reconnect with colleagues. I'm not going to conferences. Uh, so I've spent a little more time looking at their social media, trying to discover up and coming scientists. Uh, that are studying fishes. And it's uh, it's really an interesting world. There are all kinds of battles. Uh, we battle a lot with uh, team bird, people that are into birds, you know, which are birds better than fish. There's a team inverts. Uh, so it's a really interesting uh, platform. And there are people uh, that are, you know, professionals that are really active on social media. And that is uh, a great way to stay in contact. You know, you hear about their publications or um, kind of relevant uh, issues that might affect me as a scientist. I sometimes hear about them first on social media before I do, you know, maybe through a formal email list or some kind of other formal communication. So I really like that aspect of it. And again, um, I've never noodled myself for catfish. So just so for those that you don't know, noodling is an activity where it's basically hand fishing and it's quite popular in some parts of the U S um, many catfishes, um, when they breed or even when they're not breeding, I will find a hole on a riverbank to kind of hide in. And people have discovered that if you go out uh, and use your hands and feel around and reach in a hole, occasionally you'll find a catfish. And then the, the goal is to grab it by its mouth and pull it out. And if you Google um, noodling, you will find dozens of videos. There, there are DVDs you can get of people noodling or gaggling as it's sometimes called. There, there are contests to do it. Uh, and it's primarily in the U.S., but people do it in a few other places. But it's a type of hand fishing. So that's what uh, Ronald's referring to there. I, I haven't done it myself, but I, I've observed other people doing it. Yeah, I when, one type of fishing that I'm actually pretty good at is catfishing. But I am I use a pole and a line. And I You're haven't a hook and line girl. Time, but I've also heard, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm a hook and line girl. But I'm also one of those people, I'll catch it, but then I want somebody else to handle it. I don't want to touch no. it. I just want to pull it out of the water. So I'm not the worst person to go fishing with, but I do seem to have luck with, uh, with catfish, but I've also heard, um, you know, the, the noodling that, um, Ron's talking about. It's also, I've heard it also called Oki noodle. Oklahoma. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really popular for some reason, Oklahoma. Yeah. Oh, okay. And they have, there's a particular species okay. called the flathead catfish uh, that we also have here in Alabama, but Oki, Oki noodling. I think that's where they had one of the, the biggest contests. So, um, it's it, it's famous in Oklahoma, but it's you can do it in Alabama here. You'd be doing Florida. You can do it anywhere you find catfish. You just have to go out at the right time of year when the catfish are in these holes. Um, you could probably go down to the Black Belt of Alabama and go into one of the catfish ponds and uh, practice in kind of a confined environment. But uh, that's what it is. It's it's hand fishing for uh, big catfishes. John, I got yeah, a I had no idea that the Oki yeah. part was related to Oklahoma. I had yeah. no idea. I thought it was yeah. a, you know, hillbilly redneck <laughs> reference in some way. Mm. I had no idea related to the state of Oklahoma. So I, I totally learned something today. Thanks, John. <laughs> Haley, what's up? The, these different kinds of catfish that you were talking about, mm. do they have some similar characteristics? Are they? They do. There are something, but like most groups, there's always exceptions. So most catfishes lack scale. So uh, catfish are not considered kosher food. That's another thing a lot of people don't realize. Um, 
Most catfish have whiskers or barbels, you know, the, the typical things. Those are actually sensory structures and most of them have them. Um, so there, there actually is a famous quote. There was a, uh, a um, biologist in Florida called Archie Carr, who's his famous quote is any damn fool knows a catfish. And that's true for probably about 95% of them. But there are catfishes that if I showed you, you might mistake them for an eel. Uh, there are some extreme body forms. There's some that are lose their eyes in pigments. They live in the sand. You might even not realize they're a vertebrate. You might think they're an invertebrate. So there are some exceptions to that. But in general, most of them um, – or have bob barbels, whiskers, um, no scales. Uh, they generally are, are living on the bottom, but uh, that's a great question. That's interesting. <laughs> and are there are there are there saltwater catfish? Or yes, there are. There are saltwater. Yeah, catfish. there are at least two families of catfishes, including some you can catch off the coast of Alabama. We have marine catfishes. There are gaff topsail catfishes and hardhead catfishes that we get here. And then in other parts of the world, uh, in Asia, they get platocid catfishes, which are called eel catfishes, and they're both marine and um, freshwater representatives. And then a, a few other groups get things that occasionally get into salt water. The group that I work on, there's a handful of species that um, you can collect in salt water along the coast of South America. Wow. Interesting. So um, Ron, Ron shared that his, his wife is an uh -huh. OP, and that's how he learned about it. And the yes. PBS has a special. Um, oh, wow. I, haven't, I haven't seen the PBS <laughs> special, but th that, 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 that's great confirmation. Again, that's my understanding that the Oki refers to that, you know, people in Oklahoma doing this. And uh, so that's, that's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ron. We appreciate it. And we actually, we have a, a specific question. This will probably be the last thing that we'll have yeah. time for, but um, Stephen's asking about a bug that lays uh, tiny black eggs Thanks. in a type group. Mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Um, and uh, he uh, he's referencing yeah. our Facebook. Yeah, it looks like he posted a picture. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pull that. Okay. I mean, I can kind of address this. I don't know if I can tell you the exact species um, without seeing the eggs, but this is very typical for a lot of the true bugs, hemiptera, the stink bugs, assassin bugs, um, that group of uh, insects. They tend to lay these uh, dark clusters of eggs. I actually, um, last year I found a whole bunch of these that turned out to be wheel bugs, which are a large assassin bug. And they look like these, if you look at them, it looks like a bunch of little hexagons. And I actually, I got it at perfect timing. So I saw the eggs before they hatched and I documented what came out of the eggs. So that's how I figured out what, exactly what they were. Uh, but I'm guessing that's the most likely some kind of true bug, either a stink bug or an assassin bug. Well, that's again, very, that there's so much, there's so much diversity. Um, there's, mm -hmm. there's almost, there's almost no telling what, um, you know, what it could, uh, you know what you find you uh, find eggs and you don't really know kind of what's in them so that's yeah, that, well, that's, that's, that's that what I, that, that's that what i like about insects is you know there's so many of them there's so much diversity so i my interest as a biologist I, you know i find eggs like that all the time where i'll find the structure and i know it's probably been built by an insect but i'm always asking about what it is and uh i kind of they're almost like crime scenes you try to figure out like who was here and uh there are various online resources and uh i still get stumped from time to time but through my own explorations of my own house and backyard, I've discovered things like this. So uh, that's a great observation. You know, that's the only thing, you know, there are all kinds of neat observations that are all around us. It just takes you kind of to stop and smell the roses or look at the stink bug eggs, whatever it is uh, to make that connection. But that's a, a great observation. And it's, it's the right time of year. Um, we're peak insect activity. If you listen to it in our bug fest, uh, there's all kinds of sounds and sights outside of insects. Um, and, they're making other bugs. That's what they're doing. Uh, they're making all that noise and are so active because ultimately that will result in them laying eggs somewhere. And depending on it was, they may be on a plant, they may be on a, uh, your house, they may be underground, but uh, they're generating the next generation of bugs for next year's Bama Bug Fest. It's, it's always date night in the bug world, right? That's right. <laughs> Well, uh, Stephen, thank you so much for your question, Ron. Thank you for uh, for your question and uh, and comments. So um, we are we are pretty much at our our time limit. So uh, Rebecca, I'm going to turn it back over to you for uh, for our um, our wrap up the way we typically do. And I want to thank everybody for being here and joining us this morning. So thank you all so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a great discussion and uh, congrats on Bama Bookfest on the web uh, going so well.
All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this Museums from Your Home live stream. Um, we're actually going to be winding these down uh, due to the fact that the fall semester at UA is starting back up. So uh, it just just so you know, Museums from Your Home, uh, we're going to take a break from that for a little while because we do have a lot of uh, things hopefully we can do in the, in the fall. So uh, just uh, wanted to note that. A uh, good way to keep up with all of our live streams and all the pre-recorded content that we have, you can go to the UA Museums YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash UA Museums. Uh, you can also if you want some Bama Buckfest content, go to the Tuscaloosa Public Library's YouTube channel as well. If you want to support the University of Alabama Museums, you can uh, consider becoming a supporting member by visiting give.ua.edu slash museums. And uh, so that I think uh, will do it for us. Um, and so thank you to everybody who was watching live and who is going to watch this later for visiting UA Museums from your home. All right. Well, hope everybody has a, a great Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.